Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it is really a pleasure to, to host this event. Um, I think it's a very special occasion for, for us. Um, first of all, it is Friday afternoon, we're all tired. So I want to keep this kind of relaxed and open. And I would appreciate the participation of the public also in terms of questions, etc., just to, to keep a sort of constructive uh, event and to brainstorm a bit about, uh, about the things that uh, Daniel, Yoshi, and, and Julia will present. Um, this, this event is part of a series of, of presentations from the Quais Foundation uh, chair that we are hosting here at UPF. Um, uh, maybe I would like to welcome uh, Jerome, who is the co-director of the chair, to stand up and say what the chair is about. Just uh, two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> That's dangerous, I like to talk. <laughs> uh, okay, that's unexpected, I haven't prepared anything. Uh, whatever. <laughs> so basically, basically, the chair arose from a long-term collaboration we had with a radiology center. So this part of the consortium of, uh, of a companies so focused uh, on biomedical engineering and, uh, diag and diagnosis. And so, so then the, so the collaboration we had on, a, on really on a, on a narrow thematic uh, compared to the old thematics uh, covered by this, by this consortium. So we decided to uh, team up to have uh, dissemination activities, education activities with the students of, of UPF and um, a broad monitoring of all the research activities collaboration that we have on both sides. So in order to uh, foment uh, translation so, translational research in biomedical uh, engineering. Yeah, thank you. Just, uh, just also to mention that the, um, the aim of the foundation is actually focused on the patient. So, there is a, a lot of outreach in terms of uh, patient associations and these sort of things. And it's a direction where we're trying to push, yeah, to involve patients in, in our research. Um, again, the, most of you know UPF and our group. Probably most of you are part of the group anyway, <laughs> but just just to briefly say that uh, this is uh, this is MedTech, and we're a group of about what 70 people or so working on different areas of image processing, signal processing, machine learning, biomechanical simulation, as says Jerome, uh, computer-assisted surgery, uh, medical devices, etc. So a range of topics. Um, the um, the occasion today is, uh, is um, very timely. In fact, we are going to see what the, some of the best groups in the world are, are doing uh, regarding new trends of research uh, involving things like deep learning, but other aspects as well. Uh, the first speaker is Daniel Ruckert. I, I remember meeting Daniel um, you know, like 20 years ago or so. It must be about 98 or so, having beers in, in Oxford and things. Uh, so we, we know each other for a long time, Daniel and, and Julia as well. And uh, Daniel has become uh, like, a, like a god in the community. I mean, Mika, you had how many papers in Mika? Like 20 or so? This is, no, no, but almost. <laughs> so, and uh, he's also the head of the computing department in, in Imperial College. Um, actually, I, I will ask you, as you give the talk, to, to first introduce a bit your, uh, your story, because I think it's better I'm t I always try to ask this because it's nice to, to give this view to the students. Yeah. I, I never do anything, yeah, I ask these people. So, so I <laughs> it's, it's good to, to give also PhD students, postdocs, etc., a bit the overview of what senior people in the group did in their careers and the choices they took, so very briefly. But, yeah. And I would like to welcome Daniel to give the talk, please. So I hope this works. Okay, great. So uh, again, um, I have prepared something, uh, some slides, but of course not what Miguel has just asked me to do. Uh, it seems uh, that this is sort of a reoccurring theme. So um, I can give you a brief background uh, uh, to what I did before. So actually, I think I met Miguel when we were uh, probably, I think you were a PhD student. I just finished my PhD. Um, I did my PhD at Imperial uh, College. Uh, in medical image analysis, but I actually didn't really 
uh, do a lot of uh, close collaboration with clinicians at that time. Um, and then I actually, after finishing my PhD at Imperial, I went uh, to a group at Guy's Hospital to a radiology department to do a postdoc. And that was really where I got heavily involved in, in medical imaging and actually also seeing how it's clinically used by, uh, by clinicians. And this was a very insightful uh, time. I was there for two years, and I worked mostly on non-rigid registration during that time. Um, and some of you might know uh, the work we did on re non-rigid registration. And then after two years, um, I was very lucky. I got a faculty position back at Imperial in the computer science department. So I moved back to Imperial, um, and I've stayed since then at Imperial. Uh, we have a group called the Biomedical Image Analysis Group, um, which is quite similar to perhaps the setup you have uh, here. Uh, I have two colleagues who work with me, uh, Bernhard Kainz and Ben Glocker. Some of you might know them. And we have a team of sort of around 40 people in the group. Um, we are quite heavily focused on more the image analysis side. We do less, um, for example, computer-assisted surgery or robotics. Uh, in surgery and less simulation, but we have quite a lot of focus on real-time uh, imaging. And actually, we try to also go from the whole, from the start of the acquisition pipeline to the final diagnosis pipeline. And I'll show you some of these examples uh, uh, later. So I hope that's a reasonable <laughs> introduction. Uh, and I would ask you, I realize it's, yeah, it's Friday afternoon, ask questions. I'm very happy if you interrupt me or at the end, ask questions, and for Oscar there will be a, a small quiz at the end, whether you paid attention. Uh, so. I'm taking notes. Yeah, exactly. That's. So I, I sort of had a sort of catch-all title here, uh, because I wasn't quite in advance sure what I will talk about. Um, so I wanted to sort of give you, let's see whether this works, probably use this. Uh, give you an overview of what we have done uh, in the last couple of years in the space of sort of using AI machine learning uh, for medical imaging. You have all seen these headlines, which look quite scary. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about whether our machine learning solutions are they reliably uh, are they reliable? Are they, for example, unbiased, or how much how biased are they? And how can we, for example, interpret uh, what machine learning does? You can see, for example, here this article says AI can predict whether you're, or can view, can measure whether you are gay just by looking at your picture. Um, and obviously that's something where um, it's probably wrong anyway, but even if it would be right, you would like to have an explanation, actually, why, uh, why did you come up with this solution? In medicine, there's also a lot of uh, newspaper headlines. Not all of them are uh, particularly helpful. Uh, and you can sort of see that they sort of proclaim the end of, um, of humans in radiology. And actually, some of our colleagues, if you look at them, um, this is actually probably, I mean, you all know Jeff Hinton, who was sort of one of the pioneers of uh, neural networks, um, has made this statement uh, a year ago in an interview. It's probably not the best statement. It's also taken a bit out of context. Uh, he said actually quite a lot of things uh, but he also said, oh, we should really not bother with radiologists anymore, uh, which I don't think is quite the right uh, approach. I think a much better quote uh, is from a radiologist. Um, obviously, he has a, gives you a slightly different perspective on what he thinks will happen. And he says, oh, it will not really replace uh, radiology, but it will augment radiology. And sort of your new radiologist will effectively be like a data scientist uh, using AI to interpret uh, medical images. So there's been a lot of sort of uh, uh, new sort of uh, machine learning approaches which have been engineered really well, but there's also uh, something else happening in medical imaging which didn't quite used to be the case. Uh, if you, for example, now uh, go uh, to speak to medical imaging researchers in the UK, a lot of them will tell you, oh, we're starting to use very large data sets such as the UK Biobank, and I don't know whether all of you know, for example, the UK Biobank. It's a quite interesting study. Um, they have now imaged almost 20,000 subjects. Um, they do very comprehensive imaging. Uh, 
Um, and it's a cross-sectional population study. So it's a normal cross-section of the population. So these are not patients. They're doing, in addition to just a whole body imaging, they're doing dedicated brain imaging. Uh, for example, uh, not only structural brain imaging, but also diffusion and functional brain imaging. And they, for example, do uh, cardiovascular MRI, uh, a number of different sequences. In addition, they have all this information about uh, lifestyle, about genetics, and they're also going to link uh, to your healthcare records uh, prospectively. So in a couple of years' time, you can actually look at what happened to this cross-section of the population. And for example, did they develop certain diseases or not? So all of this is a, is a really exciting uh, uh, data set, for example, to use machine learning for. And um, we saw already uh, this morning a very nice uh, piece of work uh, by Sergio presenting unsupervised machine learning approaches. And of course, this is also an unsupervised learning problem because you don't really have any labels for this data set. It's just a cross-section of the population. But for example, you can actually, for the first time, in a large cross-section of the population, look at the interaction between, for example, brain health and cardiovascular health, which is also very interesting because we used to study only one organ system at a time. So I'll show you a few uh, applications of machine learning. I'll go through this uh, quite quickly because I really don't want to uh, bore you too much uh, uh, to death, except to say that really, with machine learning, you can almost do everything in the, in, the, in the pipeline for imaging, from the actual acquisition to really the ultimate goal, uh, which is not really only disease detection and diagnosis, but actually almost sort of predicting which patients will develop a disease before you can actually even uh, see it normally uh, in the imaging. So this would be the ultimate goal. And actually, as a healthcare system, the higher you can go and actually deliver a model which will work, the higher the value you get. Because really, uh, at the lower end, what you traditionally typically do with machine learning is you basically improve the workflow, correct? If I can image quicker, then actually I can um, get through more patients through the, through the system. But actually, if I, could disease, if I could predict the disease before it uh, starts, then of course I can actually do something to prevent it and save even more money. So all of what we're going to do, uh, what I'm going to show you, is based on this one. Uh, 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 the math is effectively based, based on this one slide. Um, it's basically using neural networks um, to, uh, to basically uh, do all the image processing. And we're going to use these very deep convolutional neural networks, uh, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, and they're trying to effectively uh, solve a problem which we can characterize, which we can separate into two groups. I'm only going to show you two groups of networks. So the first network looks like this. And these are just schematics. Um, it will take in a group of images, uh, which have per image a label. So all of these images here are labeled as cats. All of these images are labeled as dogs. And what the network does is it has a group of convolutional filters, which are learned. Uh, uh, which you then pass through an activation function, you pool the information, you contract the features, you keep on doing this, and typically here at the end you have a sort of fully connected uh, layer, and then you get a probability distribution out which tells you, uh, for example, this image here uh, has a very high likelihood of showing you a dog, and this image here has a very high likelihood of showing you a cat. Okay? So this is one type of network. The second type of network, which I'm going to show you, is very similar, except that instead of actually, after contracting the information, we don't try to make a single classification, but we do something which we would call a dense classification. So basically, the output has roughly the same size as the input, has also a spatial arrangement, so the, 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 the variables I'm trying to predict have a spatial arrangement, and they could be, for example, labels, or they could be numbers. So you can view this as a classification problem, like here. Or if I want to, for example, predict how, uh, how a, uh, let's say, a grayscale image would look like of the cat, uh, 
I can, for example, t uh, write this down as a, class, uh, as a regression problem. Okay? So the key feature here is that I'm contracting in this, uh, in this network information, and I'm basically forcing the network to learn higher levels of information, or learn a high level representation of the features, and then I'm expanding it again to come up with this dense classification. Um, and then you can do uh, lots of tricks. So if you look at something like a UNET approach, which many of you might be familiar with, you introduce skip layers and so on. So there are many variants of how this network will look in, uh, in a concrete situation. But the basic idea is always the same. Okay? So I'm going to show you effectively uh, four applications. Each one of them uses effectively one of these two networks I've shown you. But we do a lot of sort of problem-specific adjustment to make the network work for a particular task. And the first task is actually image reconstruction. I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with how MR images are reconstructed. Okay, a few. Okay. So I'll give you a sort of a, a bit of a nutshell of an introduction in how MR works. So how MR is actually a very useful modality. It produces great images with great contrast, usually very good resolution, but it's quite slow to acquire. So if you have a static object like the brain, that's not a problem. But if you have a dynamic object, for example, the fetus inside the mother, uh, or for example, you have respiratory motion or cardiac motion, it makes it very hard to acquire images of objects which move or which deform. And the only real options you have uh, in that case is to either image as fast as you can. This is probably what you would do, for example, with fetal imaging. Uh, but you only get 2D images, and the image quality is not as good. Or what you typically do in cardiac imaging is you gate your image acquisition. So you collect a bit of information during every heartbeat. So if I show you this image here, this image of the heart, this is actually not a single heartbeat. This is actually a collection of, let's say, uh, approximately 10 heartbeats. So the patient has to hold their breath for 10 seconds. Uh, you collect uh, information during that 10 seconds. And then you use an external sensor uh, or signal, such as the ECG, to sort the information and actually then collect enough information to reconstruct the different phases of the heart. So you actually see that this is a quite slow acquisition. I spend 10 seconds. Uh, I have to do this over and over again to acquire every single slice of the heart. So this actually becomes quite painful. It's not painful, really. It's just slow. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize that that was probably the best choice of words. So why is it slow? Well, actually, the MR physics uh, work as follows. What you do is you acquire uh, not the image pixel by pixel, but you acquire it uh, effectively frequency by frequency. So what you do measure with MR is a K-space, and that K-space is effectively the frequency domain, which you can then simply reconstruct the image by applying a Fourier transform. So actually, the reconstruction algorithm is super easy because it's just a Fourier transform. The only problem is you have to traverse this K space uh, sequentially. You cannot measure it in parallel. There is something called parallel imaging in MR, but it's not actually measuring multiple uh, frequencies in parallel. And that sequential traversal of the K space is what's effectively uh, slow. So you can actually measure very rapidly in this direction, but in this direction, the measurement process is very, very slow uh, for physics reasons. Um, so this is quite slow. And moreover, if you want to do dynamic imaging, which we want to do, for example, in the heart because we're in interested in the function, you have to repeat this process over and over again. And actually, there's only a small amount of the image which changes. So the obvious conclusion is there's a huge amount of redundancy in the data, because if you image the whole chest, only the heart is beating very rapidly. Okay? So how do you make this faster? Well, the simplest trick uh, is something which might work here. For example, instead of measuring all, all the frequencies in this K space, what I can do instead is I can say, actually, let me randomly 
just measure some parts of K space. And I pretend the other bit of K space is not important. I apply the Fourier transform. I get an image. And I'm not sure how well you can see this. This image has a much poorer quality than the image here at the top because it has a lot of artifacts in it. Okay? It has a lot of sort of aliasing artifacts for the very simple reason uh, that you're violating Nyquist sampling theorem. Correct? You haven't really sampled uh, properly. So there's a whole bunch of techniques uh, who, which say, actually, we can apply uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, such as based on compressed sensing, to try to recover from this image uh, the original image, or in other words, from this K space, this fully sampled K space. And it actually doesn't really matter whether you're doing it in the image space or in the K space, in principle, because there's just a linear transform going between them. So I can either do this or I can do this. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one I choose. And so the, the traditional compressed sensing techniques, uh, which have been around for 10 years or more, they all basically are machine learning techniques which use a very generic uh, prior, which basically make the assumption that the data is somehow sparse in some domain. Not necessarily in the image domain, in the pixel domain, but perhaps after you have trans uh, applied a wavelet transform or something like this. And the more recent approaches, which have been more successful, they all basically replace this generic prior with a prior which is data specific and learned directly from the data. And I'm going to show you uh, one such example. So I promised you that I'm going to only use two different types of neural networks. So the first neural network, which effectively tries to, to uh, reconstruct the image, in a nutshell would look like this. I put in my undersampled image, and I, I get out my, uh, my fully sampled image. Okay, now I can actually do this either in the image domain or in K space. And because I'm using a convolutional neural network, um, the convolutions only really make sense in the spatial domain, not really uh, because they become multiplications in the Fourier domain. So actually, if I want to use a convolutional neural network, I should actually do this in the image domain. So the network which we proposed, uh, one of our PhD students proposed, looks as follows. It's a very deep network. It has multiple of these cascades. And these cascades consist of two different blocks. So the first block is effectively convolutions uh, plus the activation function. And it effectively tries to remove these artifacts which come from aliasing from the image. So I'm removing these aliased artifacts from the image. Now, if you remove something by using a learning-based algorithm, you, of course, also want to make sure that what you actually get out is still the correct image. So what we also added is a second layer, which are these green layers, which is something which we call a data consistency layer. So you take your image, you convert it back to K-space by applying Fourier, forward Fourier transformation, and then you make it consistent with those lines of k-space you have measured, you go back, you do the next cascade, and go forwards and backwards. So you're alternating between doing an operation in the image space and in k-space. And what you get out is something which actually looks surprisingly good, I think. So here is, for example, a six-fold undersampled image as input. This is sort of the state-of-the-art compressed sensing technique using dictionary learning. This is what the CNN produces, and this is a fully sampled ground truth. And what you can see is actually these, these results look uh, uh, very, very good. You can also go to more aggressive undersampling schemes. So this is 11-fold undersampling. And this works so well because you have so much temporal redundancy in the data. Correct? If I would do this with a static brain image, I could never go that, that uh, uh, aggressively. But uh, the CNN-based reconstruction still does a very good job. The dictionary learning now gets a bit uh, oversmoothed. And if you would numerically look at how good this, um, this compressed sensing does, you look at this uh, entry here, the, the PSNR, um, 
is lower than what you would get with a CNN-based solution. But the most interesting thing is that the dictionary learning, the standard compressed sensing is super slow because it's an iterative optimization, whereas the CNN is extremely fast. You can do it in real time. So the real advantage is not only that it's actually uh, uh, more accurate, but actually that it's also much, much faster. So I showed you um, this, um, this very big network which we have. Uh, if you sort of think about this, a traditional optimization for reconstruction would effectively estimate your reconstruction as an optimization. Um, you have a data consistency, and then you sort of loop through this. The neural network I just showed you effectively is unrolling this loop in a very, very deep network. Okay, this is what we have done. And this might not be the best approach because these networks can get very, very large and very deep, and they become very difficult to train. So one option is you can use, for example, something like a recurrent neural network um, to basically reuse the weights um, and actually do this uh, more intelligently. So this network, which I've shown you here, you can unfold in two, two directions. One is unfold over the sinus sequence, but the second thing is also unfolded over the iterations uh, of, your, of your reconstruction. And if you do this, you get a, effectively a similar network as we had before, but it's much more compact. So the only thing I've done here is try to find a network which has much fewer parameters. Um, and again, if you look at this recurrent neural network, it's probably a bit easier to train, not because it's really better than the, than the, the CNN I had before. By the way, the 3D here means it's, uh, it's 2D plus time but it just has many fewer parameters, so it's easier to actually train in practice, okay? Good. So the second thing I wanna show you is, is briefly how we can do image reconstruction, um, sorry, image segmentation and super resolution with a neural network. And I start with the segmentation and I show you what's wrong with the standard segmentation. So you've seen this network before, we can obviously do this, use this for cardiac image segmentation. And actually, if you train this on a large enough data set, uh, which we have done here, we have used uh, 5,000 subjects from UK Biobank, for which we had a manual annotation. Uh, so this is over 90,000 2D slices annotated. It's actually remarkable that even as simple as possible neural network you can think of will actually do a fantastic job. If you just have enough training data, I think it's really uh, doing a very nice job. And we have now applied this in probably 25,000 subjects in Biobank. And when we do the QC, it probably failed badly on 30 images. So, of course, these are not patients, but it's actually remarkably robust. So if you compare this uh, against manual observ different manual observers. So what we have done here is we compare the automatic method versus a consensus of three observers. Um, and we also have the three observers. Then the conclusion is we don't do better than the observers, but the variability which we have is roughly the same as uh, the variability between different observers. Okay? So we, we don't do better, but we do as well uh, as a manual observer. So this seems quite promising. There will be a caveat coming up in a moment. And we could, in principle, uh, do something similar also uh, for super resolution. And the reason why we might want to do super resolution is the following. If you look, for example, at the heart, um, you typically image slice by slice. So you acquire a, a stack of slices. And this stack of slices is, is quite nice. But if you look at it in 3D, if I basically uh, stack it together in 3D, then you can see that the slices have a quite large thickness. And that means that if I don't really have an isotropic volume over time, but I actually really have a, a highly anisotropic volume over time. Now, if you're doing deep learning, the first thing uh, you always think about is, well, actually, this is a very simple learning problem, correct? If I would have some high resolution training data set, I can simulate the low resolution data by uh, simply uh, having the forward model. For example, I can uh, 
take my high resolution data set, I know the point spread function of my MR scanner, I know the slice profile, I can effectively simulate for free the downsampled data, and then I simply train a neural network to do the reconstruction. Okay, that's the easy, I mean, anybody in computer vision will tell you this works very well. And we tried it out, and we presented this two years ago at Mikai with a neural network doing exactly this. So here you produce a, take a low resolution input, um, you learn the upsampling filters. You can, for example, initialize it with a spline kernel, but then you can adjust this. This is a residual network. You get your high resolution uh, images out. Um, and if you apply this to a cine sequence, um, it actually looks quite uh, promising. So these are low resolution scans. This is what you would get with linear interpolation, super resolution, and this is the 3D. Uh, volume acquisition as a ground truth. Now, if you, you might ask, well, actually, if you can acquire the 3D volumes, why do you bother doing this? Um, for this, you have to do a breath hold of around 30 seconds. So this is not something you can ask a patient uh, to do. Uh, so it's practically not possible to do these, uh, to these breath holds. So we had a, we had a, uh, uh, we are quite lucky that we have uh, a, a large data set of these, but these are not uh, uh, patients. Now, though I told you there will be a caveat, and the caveat is the following, is that in a real setting, while you do a breath hold for every slide, which means that if you don't hold your breath in the same position, you might, for example, have uh, images acquired like this. So slices might be shifted, and in a real acquisition, this pretty much looks like what you see here. Um, you see that some slices are just misaligned because the patient hasn't really held their breath in the right uh, position. Now you apply your machine learning, your super resolution to this, and you conclude immediately that this patient will have died uh, a while ago because they obviously have a hole in their heart and nothing can really properly work, correct? Right? And your, your segmentation also doesn't look very nice. So clearly, the super resolution will only do what, what's in the image. So it doesn't actually generate very nice looking images if your data is inconsistent to start with. It's not really fault of the super resolution, but um, what we wanted to do is to train a network which actually can recognize that there might be inconsistency in the data and enforce a prior model on the data. So what we would like to do is get out such volumes, uh, super resolved, or in terms of segmentation, even if you don't, uh, if you have inconsistencies in the data. Okay. And so we effectively looked at this problem a bit more and decided actually one of the weaknesses in the standard convolutional neural network is that all your loss functions are pixel-based loss functions. They don't really learn shapes or shape priors. And we decided, actually, we want to come up with a network which takes low-resolution inputs, produces high-resolution output, both in terms of image, uh, uh, super-resolved, and the segmentation. And the idea for, we, for, for this is based on a network which is like, uh, looks like this. So it's still quite similar to the network I showed you before. It just has two components. One component is something which you can characterize as an autoencoder. So it's a network which encodes the input in a latent space representation and then decodes uh, the input, and you basically re minimize the reconstruction error. And this we train with segmentations of the heart. So what you put in here is a label map. And then we have a second component to this network where you can put in the intensity image, and you can try to force the network to predict this latent shape representation directly from the intensity image. And it hopefully will become clearer in a, in a second why we want to do this. Um, we basically uh, have this pipeline where we, for example, train the segmentation network. In the classical approach, you would simply have a loss function which minimizes the difference pixel by pixel between this image and this image, correct? Um, using your cross entropy loss. And we do that, but we have a second component where we encode both of these shapes 
into a shape representation and minimize the error between these shape representations at the same time. So the network is trained with two loss functions. One is pixel-wise loss, and the other one is a sort of uh, uh, latent uh, space representation loss. And if you do this, you can, uh, you can get much more constrained outputs. So instead of uh, getting a, an implausible uh, uh, segmentation, which effectively comes from the fact that you've just trained this on 2D segmentations, you now get an actually quite sensible 3D reconstruction of the heart. And you can do the same with super resolution. So in a super resolution setting, I'm now using the, the other part of the network, the other branch. I super resolve this image. Traditionally, I simply minimize the error between these two. But I actually now put my both grayscale images uh, into the predictor network, predict the sh latent shape representation, and also minimize this loss. And if you do this, the images you super resolved from this, instead of looking like this, will now look like this. So they're much more constrained, the solutions, as the output. Um, and we don't do any explicit motion correction here, correct? This is, uh, we actually don't try to estimate um, the, the motion compensation, because that's probably the other thing you can do. OK. So I want to show you fi one final application, and I'll do it very quickly. It's from a project which we call iFind, uh, which consists of a number of components, which basically tries to develop a new ultrasound system for fetal screening. And that ultrasound system is supposed to navigate autonomously with a robot using multiple probes to actually do the fetal screening. And uh, in order to do this, one of the things we need to do is, for example, to navigate the robot we need to automatically detect where, what we're currently looking at. So for example, giving an ultrasound image like this, we want to label this as an abdominal view. An ultrasound image like this, we want to label as, for example, showing you a view of the lips of the baby. Um, and we want to do this in real time from the ultrasound machine. So this has a number of potential applications, uh, guiding sonographers. Um, uh, having automatically a sort of a, a workflow optimization, uh, but also uh, minimizing reproducibility. We train for this, you will not be surprised, a neural network, a convolutional neural network, except now it simply has one output at the end. It will basically make one prediction which class uh, of, of uh, uh, scan plane you're looking at. Uh, and the advantage is very fast. We have trained this with uh, data from over uh, 2,500 patients. And I want to show you an example of this uh, system in action. This is something Christian Baumgartner presented at MIKAI. So what you see here is for the different standard view planes which we have, 13 different ones, you see the class prediction. And you can see that this works uh, in real time as the sonographer scans. There's almost a view of the brain cerebellum here. Um, now this is, for example, a background view. Um, there are a couple of, uh, we only have 13 different uh, scan planes and abdominal view. Um, and this system works really quite well. Uh, so if you want to look uh, in more for more details, the TMI article shows you the details. But one of the things which I think is also quite interesting, so if you look at this neural network architecture, um, before we make the final class prediction, we basically produce these low resolution feature maps, one for each class. Um, so what we can do is we can look, for example, at a prediction such as this shows a four chamber view of the heart. We can look at this particular activation. We can look at this corresponding feature map and back propagate the feature map into the original image space and see which pixels actually activate when you make this classification. And that's quite useful because you can actually now threshold these activations and automatically detect the organ in the images. So here's another demo uh, showing you this. This now runs at a slightly lower frame rate, but still quite fast. This runs now around 40 or 50 frames per second. For example, if you show it an image of the spine, it has learned where it has to look at. For a chamber view of the heart, uh, 
it knows where it's looking at. And what you can do is effectively now threshold these activation maps. Well, here's, for example, the femur. You can threshold these activation maps and automatically detect where the object is by just placing a bounding box on it. So it's not a segmentation, but it's a localization. And the nice thing is you have only trained this with image level labels, correct? I've never told the system where the heart is or uh, where it should look for. Good. So I'll conclude here. Uh, I've shown you a number of applications of deep learning for reconstruction, segmentation, but also quantification analysis. There isn't really that many uh, papers out there which really show you an application of machine learning or deep learning for a fully integrated uh, uh, decision support system, uh, but I'm sure they will come. But of course, if you really want to do this, you need to also look, need to take into account all sorts of non-imaging data. No, no radiologist or clinician will ever make a decision just by looking at an image. You always have additional information. Um, and I just want to conclude with sort of these three, three things which I think uh, are challenges for the community. Validation is challenging because quite often, and we have seen this this morning, you don't know what the ground truth is, what should you compare against. You need to work quite interdisciplinary. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm probably telling you something you have already experienced uh, a lot. And I think you can also make sure that you try to optimize the entire uh, imaging pipeline. For example, you might not really want to start working with bad quality images if there is a way how you can actually improve the image acquisition. Um, and I want to sort of just show you this with a, conclude with this slide, which I guess you can really try to integrate these three separate components into one component. And I will show you uh, what you can do with this. If you, this is something we showed in MIKI, for example. If I know that I'm looking for the heart in an MR scan, why don't I simply try to segment the case space directly? And what you see here are sort of three different uh, uh, acquisition rates. Sorry. Um, so, for example, here, only 20 lines of case space. I can still recover a segmentation of the heart, even if I go uh, very aggressively in undersampling. I can no longer reconstruct the image, so I'm only showing you the image for verification purposes. But actually, there's a lot of information directly in the sensor domain. So I should stop here and thank all our uh, collaborators and also all the funding bodies. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I have a question on the, I think the last slide before, when you were showing how to get the filters from your architecture, uh, architecture. Uh, the, for, the, for the ultrasound? Uh, yes, in this, exactly, no, the, when you show the, the architecture <coughs> itself. You say that you, exactly this one, you say that you have the same number of filters in the end as the number of labels, right? Yes. And then you go back and you can visualize your filter, but I don't, Exactly, and uh, can you elaborate a bit on how you do that? Because if, if, for example, in between the filters and the labels, you have, for example, uh, a fully connected layer. I don't know if you have fully connected so yeah, layer. Yeah, I don't have actually what I have here. These are effectively feature maps, which are 13 by 13. Uh, and I have K of these feature maps, so I have K classes. Okay, so This looks like a low resolution feature map. And actually, for example, here I just do global average pooling and the softmax. On there. So, so actually for this, the only thing which I need to invert, so there's this paper on guided backpropagation. Um, I have some pooling, uh, some spatial pooling, but I basically upsample, I'm just doing a very simple upsampling to get back to the pixel domain. So actually in this architecture, you can go back directly to the pixel space. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the, for the great talk. Uh, it's uh, curiosities, because I'm absolutely not an expert in the field. I have two questions. The first question is, when you use, when you use the ground truth to uh, reconstruct high-resolution images, so how many ground truths would you need 
for normal population or for a diseased population? Um, so I guess, no, I mean, I don't know how much I need in theory. I mean, I, I know how much we had. So we, we're quite lucky that we have a sort of genetic study where they've done almost 2,000 subjects with higher resolution data sets. So I, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty large, relatively large. I can't really comment on how well this approach would work if you have a, for example, let's say, a patient with a severe abnormality, correct? If you, for example, uh, have patients with congenital abnormalities, they might really not match any of the samples you have seen during training. Um, and one of the things, the big challenge I think is, is for our field at the moment is to not only provide a for example, an output, a classification or a super resolution, but at the same time an estimate of uncertainty. Because you basically, I think it's fine to have, for example, an image which you cannot reconstruct if you are able to tell the clinician that they shouldn't trust the reconstruction. At the moment, you will show them something and you have, it's hard to know how much you should trust. And especially if we, do what we end, did here at the end, where we're basically proposing not to reconstruct the image any longer, then it's especially critical that you know whether your, your model fits the data. Well, thanks. So it, it directly links to my second question, which is, about, which is about the validation. So you highlighted that validation is challenging. I'm in the field of mechanistic modeling for forward simulations of behavior of uh, tissues and organs, and that's the same. I mean, it's very difficult to validate it. So there is no um, a concept of indirect validation, meaning that you're not validating directly uh, whether your model is predicting something that is absolutely true, but you're validating that your model is fomenting a right interpretation of, of the system. So is it something that also occurs in, in medical image analysis? So I think we quite often do indirect validation. Actually, I think the whole field of medical science quite often does indirect validation, correct? If you basically have, for example, a, a model of how to make a clinical decision, the final validation will be either the patient is dead or, or not. But you can't, you often, quite often you can't measure directly the endpoint you're interested in or you don't know what the endpoint should be, so you come up with a quite uh, indirect measurement, um, um, or you can, for example, predict when they're going to die. I mean, eventually they all die, correct? So it's not a very useful outcome to just say they're dead. Um, so I, I think we sh I guess the whole field is, is struggling to identify what is the best way of measuring dire directly the, uh, the outcome. So if I measure, for example, a segmentation, I have a measure of how good my segmentation is but I don't know how that translates into a clinical outcome because perhaps having a 5% segmentation error makes no difference to what the clinical decision for that patient would have been. And in that case, I shouldn't really <laughs> obsess with improving the segmentation. It's a little bit going in this direction because, for example, also when you say you do like your super resolution and then you kind of find a way to make the segmentation consistent, as you say like when you have the artifact, you say there's a patient with a hole in the heart, but the thing is we get patients with a hole in the heart and these are the ones that we have to get. So the whole thing with all of this is like while conceptually and technically I think it's very nice and it's absolutely perfect to analyze normal images, but in normality you already know if I tell you normal people will have an ejection fraction of 60%, I will not be very wrong. So the question is, what happens with exactly medicine is very often to find this abnormal rare case in some ways or recognize the rare thing. It's like, how are you gonna deal with that? Because you will smooth it out always, no? Yeah, so, so one option is, uh, or one, one potential danger is to smooth it out, but the other opportunity is also to actually identify that you're that this subject doesn't fit the model of normality, correct? So if you, and that might be in itself quite useful, not pr perhaps not for image reconstruction, because in that case you would basically say, um, actually you need to go back to your traditional way of look, interpreting the images. But I guess the whole point is, at the moment we only have these very large data sets on, um, 
or normal populations, such as UK Biobank. If you now go to a clinician, a clinician can actually deal with the fact that they know roughly what normal is, but they still can interpret whether this hole in the heart is actually a real hole in the heart or whether, well, or whether they actually would have expected it here because they actually also interpret non-imaging information, correct? It's unlikely that you would find, for example, in UK Biobank, somebody who has never noticed anything and they have a, a, a hole in their heart, correct? So I think the, the one thing which I think is what I wanted to get to at the end is no clinician ever just looks at an image and interprets it completely without context. And I think we need to have, find a way of linking what we do in the image analysis community with what, for example, people do in, in other communities to integrate. But it actually comes down a little bit to the discussion that you started this morning also, I would say, your thesis is where we explicitly chose the approach to try to define variability and abnormality, where if you have an abnormal case, it will be very abnormal. You don't know or you need to then interpret it in that, but you don't do any smoothing. You just say, okay, what is there? It's like, uh, how do you see these two in the, in the different contexts? Because to me, as say you partially said, is clinical practice is much more trying to find the abnormal or trying to find the similarity, rather than trying to find what is the likelihood of something based on, I've learned a lot, I've seen a lot, and I think it's this, which in the end, what, uh, what the neural networks do. Eh? So, uh, well, I guess I, I, I would make two points. So first of all, and this is in slightly different context. For example, if you look at the image reconstruction problem, when you enforce more and more priors, one of the things which is quite interesting is, and actually what people, for example, already started to do in the CT community is, actually, I can have multiple reconstructions, correct? I can have one reconstruction which is an incredibly faith, faithful to, to your acquired data. It might look very noisy, but actually it's very faithful to the data. And I can have a heavily regularized reconstruction, and, um, which might be, for example, easier to process for a subsequent, subsequent task. So first of all, I don't think you need to always think that you can only have one model which you can use to interpret the data. The second thing about uh, that you're really only, or that you're mainly interested in, in, these, um, in these outliers from the normal population, that's clearly true, but I think we're also moving more and more to the, to the fact that, uh, to, the, to the sort of recognition that there is virtually nothing normal, correct? Everybody, if you look at the population, um, and if, especially if you start screening, so a lot of, I guess a lot of these population studies come with a sort of backdrop of perhaps we should start screening whether somebody is at risk of stroke by looking at how their heart interacts with their brain. You know, heart. So um, I think some of these approaches might just be better, for example, for screening approaches than actually for um, assisting decision making. But I think it's a crucial thing that you say is like having these different reconstructions because we, for example, had a very similar discussion. We're working at the synchrotron and do like phase yeah. contrast CT uh, reconstructions where we actually want to go to the details. And then they were uh, kind of checking and trying to use neural networks for sparse reconstruction. And whatever we were looking for scientifically was lost in the reconstruction. Okay. So it's like it really depends on your application and your, what you want to well, do. And, and, and the whole, actually, the, the, the program we have on this reconstruction is exactly what you said. The whole title of the grant is sort of application-driven MRI, correct? It's, it really depends on what you want to see. If you want to have a visual reconstruction, you will need more, much more data than if you effectively just want to have one parameter measure. Exactly. Maybe just one little question. I don't know whether you can answer it, but the UK Biobank, why the hell doesn't have an ultrasound of the heart? Which is the only MR useful is so much information. Ni <laughs> MR is so much nicer. <laughs> I think one of the, actually, but the short, I think the short answer is UK Biobank is one of the most sort of heavily reg regimented studies I've ever seen. They have a super consistent protocol which also makes things quite easy for us. But I think, but I think they, and, and for example, I, I've worked a lot with fetal sonographers. I haven't worked with fetal cardiologists, uh, with, with, with uh, echocardiologists uh, so much. But for example, the variability you get from ultrasound scanning is just, if you want to do a population study, you want to have it as tightly controlled as possible. 
Uh, well, they say that. Well, I'll just simply go for MR, which gives me better data. <laughs> we have time for only one final short question. Okay, this is kind of along the same lines, but in a lot of these cases, it seems like it's pretty difficult to obtain ground truth um, for a lot of these studies. Do you think that that can be overcome just by um, getting more data, or do you think it's something that we need other methods um, to to overcome that? Actually, I can probably hand the question back to Sergio. <laughs> it was, it's a similar question. I don't think, for example, more data will always, will help you in this particular case because more data will not really tell you uh, very much about um, what what the label would be, what the ground truth will be, correct? It will give you more data points, but not very much more. So I think you really need to think about what model, well, if you use an unsupervised or supervised approach, <coughs> in an unsupervised learning, perhaps just having more data would actually help you a lot. Yeah. So now just comes a question, the, the quiz for, for <laughs> Oscar. Later with the beers, <laughs> The bad thing is so uh, uh, standardized uh, the whole protocol that is working only on these images. I mean, I've seen super nice networks by Alistair Train on the UK Biobank data. Is all the data is acquired in the same Siemens machine, and then you apply this to a General Electric image, and it doesn't work. <laughs> But you know that UK Biobank didn't uh, acquire these images for machine learning purposes, right? They wanted to study net ventricular function. Yeah, but the problem is that it feels like everything is solved when you go to conference with this DICE score so 0 0.90, wherever, and then you realize when you are in a lab working with this that it, it there is a lot of things to do still. Oh, yeah, to, yeah. to have multicentric studies working on multicentric databases. So. The problem of uniformity and homogeneity in these databases, well, it is a problem. No, but it just shows you that if you have good, if you have a lot of good data, you can actually do very well. And I guess for those PhD students, if you're still working on this, there's, as you say, plenty of problems still to be solved. Okay, thank you very much.